Last month, I was in a university class and we were exploring populism. And in between the barrage of Donald Trump propaganda videos and Brexit posters, I noticed that the entire class had this implicit mindset that to be a populist is a bad thing. And therefore that to be called a populist is indicative of one's being bad. Now I think this is a pretty scary view for society in general to hold because populists are by and large the ones who critique political authority. Donald Trump tells us we need the swamp to be drained. The Democrats tell us that Trump shouldn't even be in office and in Europe the Italians have just elected a bunch of populist politicians and parties. Now these are all questions that we need to be exploring. Are the Washington elite corrupt? Are the EU elite corrupt? Is Donald Trump corrupt? No, we cannot always assume that the elite are corrupt, but at the same time we can't always assume they're legitimate either. And this seems to be what people are doing when they disavow all populism. So today I'm going to talk about and deconstruct that implicit mindset, because no one else seems to be doing it. I am going to make three points that will lead towards my conclusion. The first will be that it's not necessarily a bad thing to be a populist. The second will be that the word populist as criticism doesn't make sense, it does not let itself make sense, and I'll explain the kind of weird logic I've used to do that later. And the third and final point is that populist as a black and white term is meaningless. The conclusion that I'm trying to reach is that if someone is called a populist, so what? You shouldn't immediately assume they are right or wrong, you shouldn't immediately side with whoever opposes or supports them. And I think that this is a very important tool for a democratic society because we must be able to debate and critique and campaign against those in power. And I think if we disavow all populism, we are denying ourselves that tool. Before we start, let's get it straight. What is populism? Because at the moment, populism um, seems kind of like fascism. It's, it's a word that's vague, it's ill-defined, and at the same time it's used pejoratively by one's opponents. That is, you call someone a populist, or indeed a fascist, in order to belittle them. So let's get a definition. Well, one common line of thought is that populism just means popular. But as Cass Mudd, who's a Dutch political scientist, points out, that is quite an oversimplification of the matter, because populists genuinely do have more in common than just their popularity. Populism is not an ideology. It has no policy recommendations. It doesn't believe in anything. This is why populism can be left or right wing. What it really is, is a discursive strategy. That means it's a way of portraying the world through the language that we use. That phrase is taken from Bonikowski, 2016. Now, some people, such as Christabel Kaltwasser in this Bloomberg article, they say that populism is a thin-centered ideology that needs to be combined with other ideologies in order to get a full picture. But I disagree with that because no policies are necessary conditions for populism. Populism can go for anything. It's more about the language that the populists use to portray their policies than the policies themselves. In the postmodern vernacular, you call this way of using language a narrative. For example, you would say that the narrative of environmentalism is that of profit versus the planet, or the narrative of Marx is that of class war. The narrative of populists is us versus them. So in populist rhetoric, you split society up into two camps. You have us, we the people, and them, the, the corrupt people who aren't really part of the team. That phrase is very common in the study of populism. Cass Mudd, in particular, uses it a lot. In left-wing populism, the them is the political and economic elite who are now corrupt. Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro blasted Donald Trump on Friday following a fresh round of U.S. sanctions and strong condemnation of his government by the U.S. leader. In Venezuela, there is a government digno, and here we are, de pie. Saca tus manos de aquí, Donald Trump. Saca tus manos, cochinas de aquí. Ya basta de intervencionismo imperialista. Whereas in right-wing populism, you have the same corrupt leaders, but they're in what's called an unhealthy coalition with minority groups such as um, the unemployed, migrants, Muslims or Jews. It can really be anyone. President Trump is right. Build the wall. Stop illegal immigration now. I will break up soon and I will kill more. Democrats who stand in our way will be complicit in every murder committed by illegal immigrants. The phrase unhealthy coalition is taken from 
a paper by Muller in 2015 called Passing Populism. Now I must note that I despise the terms left and right wing because they're vague and usually when people say them they're never talking about the same thing twice. But here I'm using them in the pop culture sense, I'm not using them in the philosophical sense, so I hope that's okay. So let's go on to my first point, that it is not necessarily a bad thing to be a populist. This is because portraying society as an us group versus a them group is not always incorrect. Claude Lefort, who was a uh, French philosopher, he says that populist rhetoric extracts a people within the people, that the language of populism creates the division between us and them. But I ask you to consider, what if by their actions, some groups of people in society have already separated themselves from the people, and the populists are just pointing it out? For example, what if the elite really are corrupt? Or what if the people who the elite are letting past our borders really do want to harm us? These are questions we do have to ask. So for me, that's the difference between fake populism and real populism. In fake populism, the language creates divisions. Whereas in real populism, the actions create the divisions, and then language just points them out. Now, incidentally, this is typical of the postmodern mindset to miss the distinction between fake and real populism. If I ask an ordinary guy why he uses certain words, he will say, because they describe the world around me. He says the word running to describe someone who's running. He says the word car to describe a car. We construct uh, our language based on what the world looks like to us, but postmodernism is obsessed with the idea that language precedes reality, that language comes first, and then it forces us to conceive of the world in a certain way, or in this case, it forces us to divide the world up. There is no room in the postmodern mindset to consider whether populist rhetoric is truthful, because words come first, and then reality follows. This is for me why I think the discussion has focused more on how populist rhetoric is dividing us, than whether populist rhetoric is truthful. Anyway, let's go back onto the point I'm making. I'm going to give you a quote by Kaiser Wilhelm II. Here he's speaking in Holland in exile in 1938. And see if you can guess who he's talking about. There is a man alone, without family, without children, without God. He builds legions, but he doesn't build a nation. A nation is created by families, a religion, tradition. It is made up of the hearts of mothers, the wisdom of fathers, and the joy and exuberance of children. And the Kaiser continues, he says, Germany will be an all-swallowing state, disdainful of human dignities and the ancient structure of our race, sets itself up in place of everything else. And the man who alone incorporates in himself this whole state has neither a god to honour, nor a dynasty to conserve, nor a past to consult. Now this is undeniably populist rhetoric, the Kaiser is setting up an us versus them dichotomy because he's claiming that Hitler and his supporters are them. They're not the real Germans. But of course he's right. And had the German people realized this, history would have been very different. And instead they fell for the fake populist rhetoric of the Nazis, which of course was that ethnic Germans are us. And the them is encapsulated by that terrible phrase, Lebens und Wertes Leben. And by the way, that is a quote that everyone who feels tempted by the alt-right needs to hear. Because fascism, just like socialism, does not represent your history or white civilization, whatever that means. Fascism sought to build new nations, not support the old ones. Hitler even talks in his private speeches about wanting to get rid of the church once he's finished with the communists. That does not sound very pro-European to me. I'm going to include the link to that interview with the Kaiser in the description. So it's clear then that if we as a society delegitimize all populist rhetoric, then we are kowtowing to political authority. We are denying ourselves the ability to criticize threats in government or elsewhere, and that is really dangerous. So that's my first point, that it is not necessarily bad to be a populist or say populist things, because sometimes those things are correct. But perhaps you are not yet convinced. Perhaps you still think that us versus them rhetoric is illegitimate and therefore should be delegitimized. Well, here's my second point. You believe that populist rhetoric is illegitimate. It's a lie. It should be ignored because it sets up an us versus them dichotomy. So you call certain politicians populists and you disavow them. They do not speak for us. That's what you tell everybody. And so you split the debate up 
On the one side, you have the legitimate politicians and their supporters who toe the line and are never too controversial. And on the other side, you put the populists and their supporters, who, by the way, are really stupid for supporting the populists and are also probably horrible people. Indeed, you probably sound a lot like this lady. You could put half of Trump's supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables. <laughs> right? The racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, you name it. Now you can relax. You've got the us group, the legitimate group, and you've got the them group, the populists. And you can tell all your friends not to listen to them. Just focus on us. Well, hold on. Didn't you just say that us versus them rhetoric is illegitimate? This is my point. By claiming that one part of society is illegitimate, because they claim that one part of society is illegitimate. You're committing the very crime you claim to denounce. Yes, you are right to believe that some views are populist, but you don't beat those views by calling them populist. You beat those views by debating them, with the added bonus that, as I said in my first point, maybe those views are correct and you find that out. Even if our political debates don't use populist as a bad label, I still think we care far too much about who is and isn't populist. Populist rhetoric features enemies of the people, them, the dangerous political or economic elite. Now, when a leader is corrupt, it's really easy to call them an enemy of the people. I mean, they're using their position in office to better themselves, usually at the expense of the country and the public they claim to support. But what's not so obvious is when a leader pushes for policies that harm the people, even if they genuinely believe in those policies, you can still call them an enemy of the people because they're hurting the people. A really good example of this is Jeremy Corbyn and, and with him the kind of entire die-hard Labour mindset. Now they don't explicitly say that the Tories are corrupt and they're just using office to get themselves and their friends rich most of the time. But it's very easy for Labour and their supporters to say that the Tories are pushing for policies that harm the public and therefore the Tories aren't part of real British society. They're separate, they're a parasite, they're here to hurt us. They are enemies of the people. The older generation is being reminded of a central truth in British politics. You can't trust the Tories. <laughs> you can't trust the Tories with your pension, with your tax credits, with your personal independence payments, with your national insurance contributions. One U-turn and broken promise after another by this Conservative leadership has made that absolutely clear. So really, anyone whose policies you disagree with, you can just call enemies of the people. Cass Mudd, who I mentioned earlier, puts this very well. Almost all politicians will say something populist at some point. And if we take populist as a black and white label, either you are or you are not populist, then everyone's going to be a populist because everyone says something populist at some point. And therefore the term is meaningless, it applies to everybody. It doesn't help you understand the world in any better way. So there are my three points. Populism as a political phenomenon might be very interesting to investigate, but in terms of deciding on who you support, it really shouldn't have any impact whatsoever. I'm simply saying that you should make up your own mind about who you choose to vote for. Now, one common critique of populism is that it undermines trust in democracy and democratic institutions because we all think the system is rigged and therefore we don't want to participate in it and we start supporting radical alternatives like a dictator. But the best way to fix that problem is to increase the transparency of institutions so we know whether they're rigged or not. It's kind of ridiculous to expect the public to just trust institutions because the leaders of those institutions have said, don't worry about the populists, I promise I'm a really nice guy. The problem here is not populism. Populism is a symptom. The problem is that the deep state can operate entirely outside of public scrutiny. Uh, you know, in this sense, WikiLeaks has done more to quell the populist fervor than every single Love Trump's Hate bumper sticker ever created. And this is the paradox of trusting democracy. When we don't trust authority, authority behaves itself because it knows we're keeping an eye on it, so we can trust it. But when we do trust authority, authority doesn't behave itself because it knows we're not looking out, so we shouldn't trust it. That's all I have to say for now. I will include a link to the Bonikowski paper in the description because it's a really good read. And please, if you think I have missed something out or I have got something wrong, let me know and I will try my very best to respond.
Thank you very much.